Hi, Sean McElroy with our AutoLine exclusives. Joining me today is Annie Chang, the head of new mobility for SAE International. Annie, I want to thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me here. Well, as I said, you're the head of new mobility and this whole environment that we're in right now, people locked down, not driving around. It, it's got to be a crazy and fascinating time for you. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, it, our everyday lives have been completely disrupted um, and that definitely trickles down to our mobility behavior. Um, definitely, we have seen uh, less cars on the roads, um, but as we'll get into it later, um, that may not necessarily be all good news. Um, and we are definitely seeing a lot of changes in our mobility realm and probably some may stick around. Yeah, so to let everybody know, you've got this report coming out that's looking at kind of the impact of COVID-19 on, you know, kind of all aspects of mobility. Can you give us a little mm -hmm. brief uh, thumbnail of uh, what the report's about? Yes. Yeah, so our report is called Rethinking the Way We Move Beyond COVID-19. And it was really driven by our curiosity on um, how are different modes being impacted by COVID-19 and the accompanying uh, policies such as stay at home, shelter in place. And how have uh, the different modes picked up and recovering differently? Um, what does the future look like for our mode share and mode shift? Um, we also look at road safety. So how has it impacted the number of crashes in different um, areas, especially in urban areas? So we did a deep dive in New York City, for example. So, you know, we've seen travel drop off. Obviously, everybody was locked up at home. Now we're starting to see things being unlocked and some more travel pick up, or at least I think I've you know, I feel mm -hmm. anecdotally I've seen more cars out on the road, but are we actually seeing some travel pick back up again now? Yes. Um, whether it's good news or bad news, <laughs> we are seeing um, way more travel. Um, we saw the biggest decrease, the drop in mid-March. Um, and I'm using the Apple Mobility Trends Report data. So that data tells you the relative volumes of um, the directions requests uh, in Apple Maps by driving, walking, or transit. So we have seen uh, driving pick back up. Um, they're almost 100% now. Uh, we have um, seen inverse reports saying that driving is only 20% you know, lower than it was um, you know, in February when we were looking at mid-May uh, numbers. So we are seeing that and we are seeing um, transit, for example, uh, ha has plummeted and has not recovered. Um, so I think that our mode shift will um, be pretty uh, dramatic um, as we see folks uh, leaving transit to in search for other modes and whether they're going to go to single occupancy vehicles or they're going to move to say more active or micro mobility, I think time will tell, um, but uh, that's going to define our new normal in mobility. Is there anything that you're seeing that's kind of driving this uh, drive away from, you know, like, uh, we'll say buses or taxis or things like that uh, into personal mobility? Uh, is there, is it just the matter of cleanliness or are you seeing anything that's put, making that push? Yeah, um, I think it's our general fear, right, of sharing things and space. Um, these are a new set of considerations that um, frankly, were almost non-existent uh, a few months ago. So um, just driven by that fear, folks are quite wary of returning to transit, uh, despite the efforts that public transit agencies have made to um, maintain cleanliness and um, to sanitize their stations, equipment, and their vehicles. Um, in terms of ride healing, we have seen um, that also plummet. I think time will tell in terms of um, how quickly that's going to be picked up and what are the different um, initiatives these ride healing companies will um, put in place um, in order to uh, you know, uh, encourage uh, riders and make them feel safe again. Yeah, so I, I'm wondering if you know, we're going to see this different mix of vehicles out there. You know, maybe uh, some of these mobility providers might have new opportunities. You, you know, you mentioned more people are walking or maybe they can hop into the scooter business or something. 
But one thing that those types of businesses have always done is offset the amount of vehicles on the road because they're, you know, taking more riders and people aren't using their own vehicles. Are we going to, after this is all over, could we potentially see more traffic on the road than we did before? I think um, that is a very likely scenario, unfortunately. And um, that will further exacerbate all the issues that we have, the externalities related to um, private vehicles on the road, such as air pollution, traffic, uh, congestion, and um, road safety issues. I think that is the fear that we are um, currently faced with. Um, we meaning the cities, the, the civil engineers, the urban planners, um, that uh, we are, perhaps driving to a hell scenario where we emerge finally from the pandemic only to be locked down by traffic, right? Um, so I think that um, there needs to be a lot of action that uh, needs to take place at this time to um, nudge the people, the individuals to um, select, uh, you know, their travel modes, um, you know, with um, sustainability and safety in mind at the society level. Yeah, and I think one of the other kind of scary things that your report kind of pointed out that even though there is less people out there, that does mean there's left less accidents going on. But the way people are driving has changed. And that could kind of prevent a scary scenario for once people go back, is that uh, that new driving behavior going to stick around? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so less cars on the road means less um, fewer interactions between road users. And um, that can mean fewer crashes in general. Um, what we have seen is the number of crashes have generally decreased, but the severity of crashes, which is mainly determined by speeds and whether you are a protected road user, so in your car or not, um, those things uh, have changed. So I think that the main issue here is that we know that speed kills and speed has gone up thanks to less cars. Um, and uh, we have seen a lot of uh, fatal and injury crashes. And, um, you know, if we see that uh, there is a mode shift towards uh, cycling or other micro mobility modes, um, the reality is as that picks up, so will the crashes un unless we do something about it. So I, at this point, we are um, actively or should be actively looking for countermeasures to um, offset the traffic volumes going back up um, and then maintaining lower levels of crashes. Yeah, you know, I, we had a story in our Autoline Daily program that we ran that the uh, the Cannonball Run, which is a trip from New York to California to see who can do it the, quist, the quickest, that record has been broken something like seven times in the last five months. So, you know, there's just another, you know, little data point that kind of points yeah. just to what you're talking about in this report. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that um, we forget that road traffic fatalities and injuries, it's actually an epidemic of its own, right? We don't need COVID-19 to remind us that it is an epidemic. And the sad part is it's largely preventable. So um, we can do a lot. Um, you know, we have seen cities uh, take um, their streets like Seattle, for example, um, more than 20 miles have been um, permanently closed to most of motor traffic. Um, those kind of initiatives will help uh, micro mobility users and active travelers feel safe and comfortable um, going back on the streets or even shifting away from single occupancy vehicles to a more sustainable mode. Now, do you feel like some of these changes that cities and mobility providers are making could be permanent? Um, I certainly hope so. I think that um, in terms of the road design, I think some of it will stay. Um, there has been commitments from, um, you know, different uh, cities uh, across North America. Um, and I think from the uh, mobility provider perspective, definitely, I think um, they're uh, getting prepared, mentally prepared um, uh, to have this long-term impact of COVID, whether that's our mentality and feeling not so safe sharing things in space or um, the need to um, use different modes for um, purposes that we didn't before. 
And I guess, you know, kind of the good thing coming out of this is that we probably have a great opportunity to make some changes to some of the things that, you know, maybe aren't greatly designed or whatever. Yes, um, I think that, that is a lot to do with the civil engineering perspective. Um, our street geometry has been very kind to um, drivers, but not so kind to vulnerable road users. Um, they are called vulnerable road users for a reason, right? Um, so I think uh, there is definitely an opportunity for us to make more room for um, these active and uh, micromobility um, users um, and shift our focus to making it you know, a more, much more um, forgiving environment for them rather than the focus on uh, private vehicles. Well, that's great to know that this is the time for change and that we, we can do it. Uh, Annie, uh, talking about the report here, when's it come out? Where can uh, people pick it up at? Yeah, it should be available sometime this week, um, and uh, it will be on SA.org. Uh, we will share the information and announce it uh, when it's ready. But um, it's just a five-page report with a deep dive on New York City, looking at uh, the implications of road safety and hopefully provide a little bit of an optimistic view of um, COVID-19 and its impact on mobility and hopefully uh, we can find uh, the silver lining in all of this. Yeah, totally agree. Well, Annie Chang, SAE International, I really wanna thank you for taking the time today. Thank you so much for having me.